Hi there. My name is Lucas Weiss, and I am the host of the Wee Sports Quarantine Chronicles. For today's episode, I'm joined by Tony Ambrogio. Tony is a multimedia Canadian journalist who's had stops at The Score, Sportsnet, and TSN. In this episode, I chat with Tony about how he got into broadcasting, his various experiences at different Canadian sports networks, as well as his advice for young broadcasters looking to break into the industry. The Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. So make sure to subscribe, like, rate, and watch to all three of those channels. This is episode 24 of the Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles. All right, for today's episode of the Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles, I am joined by a jack of all trades in sports media. He's a broadcaster, he's a writer, he's a host, he's a public address announcer, he's a teacher, and he is Tony Ambrosio. Tony, welcome to the Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles. How are you? Lucas, thanks so much. I'm great. Uh, thank you for the invite, and I'm really looking forward to being along with you today. Absolutely. And I wanted to start off with, with sort of talking about, you know, your, your career, which, you know, a lot of, you know, unique stops and a lot of great accomplishments. But in doing research, you're from London, Ontario, and, you know, you always had dreams of being a play-by-play broadcaster. So I'm curious who were your broadcasting idols growing up? Well, it's, it's funny. So I was born in the late 1960s. So I grew up in the 70s and 80s with hockey. So Bob Cole was a guy I really admired. Big fan of Danny Gallivan. Loved Brian McFarland and his uh, Peter Puck. But you know what? It's funny. The guy that I really admired growing up was Dick Enberg. Mm. So Dick did tennis for NBC and, of course, football for NBC. And there was just something about his style. I was a huge Steelers fan, as you can tell by the blanket in the back. And he did the AFC games at NBC. So it seemed every week if the Steelers were on TV as a kid, it was Dick Enberg doing the play-by-play. So he kind of became the guy that I admired, the guy that I really kind of tried to model my style after. And as much as I tried to do play-by-play, you realize pretty quickly how hard it is, and you realize how many talented people there are. So I kind of moved and veered into another direction. But but Dick Enberg was the guy for me. And, and as an aside, when I was very young, maybe 13 or 14, I wrote a letter to Dick Enberg. Mm. And I thought, oh, he'll never respond. And sure enough, he responded with a three-paged typed note that kind of gave me a lot of great hints about what it takes to be not only a play-by-play person, but someone in broadcasting, someone in the media. And he also sent me an autographed picture, and he autographed it, oh my, Dick mm-hmm. Enberg, which was his trademark, oh my. So uh, that to me is probably, well, you know, you get a lot of cool things as a kid. And, and that was right up there for me, for sure. But the Dick Enberg was the, was number one for me. And Gallivan, Bob Cole, Brian McFarlane, all those guys, Dave Hodge, certainly not far down the list. Certainly for me, you know, as well, Bob Cole, I listened to growing up and, and, and until his retirement. But do you still have the autograph and the three-page note from Dick Enberg? I do. So it's in my mom's house in London. Okay. Along with bunch of hockey cards and baseball cards and I remember getting Bobby Orr's autograph, a Jean Beliveau's autograph, Daryl Siller was one of my faves, I got his autograph. So all those important memorabilia is safely tucked away in my family's house in London. No, that's good because it's always important to have a treasure trove of, of all those early memories that you know you know represent how how passionate you were of course about sports and broadcasting and you, you, you attend Fanshawe College, and then you get an opportunity to then go to Owen Sound uh, to, to work at Bayshore Broadcasting. And I know for a lot of young journalists, Tony, who, who listen to this program, I mean, you know, they, they have those dreams of, of working for a big market like Toronto, like Vancouver, which is fine. But sometimes you got to get your feet wet and, and your hands dirty in a smaller market. So I'm just curious – what those experiences were like at Owen Sound and how, how did it shape your journalism career? Yeah, that's a really good point, Lucas. I know when I was young and probably very naive, my first thought was I'm going to Hockey Night in Canada or I'm <laughs> going to be on TSN. Uh, you know, that was what you think right away. But going to Owen Sound, so it wasn't sports, it was news. 
But that was okay because I went to Fanshawe College, the broadcast journalism program, and it was heavily geared toward news. And at that time, we didn't have two or three or whatever television networks, didn't have the websites that are available now, podcasting, vlogcasting, whatever you want to call it. So I understood the importance of news. So I was okay with it. So I go to Owen Sound. I'm naive. I'm young. I'm not very smart. I'm learning a lot. My common sense button wasn't very high. So you grow up in a hurry. And I learned a lot in a hurry. And I tell my students this all the time. The first time I had to do an interview where I was getting paid because it was working for the radio station, there was a fire. And I was a news reporter. So there was a whole house fire. And you could see the house fire destroyed. And I got there. And that's always the toughest thing to do, to talk to someone after an accident or a house fire after a tragedy. You know, that's the first thing I think journalists learn when they, when they do this business is you're going to have those tough times. So here I am, early 20s, very nervous. I see the gentleman. His house is burned down. So I go over and I go talk to him. And I'm kind of him shaking a bit. I'm nervous. And I turn on my tape recorder. I do the interview. And he was tremendous. Gave wonderful answers. Really heartfelt, very emotional. I'm thinking, you know, I've got... Wonderful sound here. It'll make a very nice report. I go back to play the sound, and there's nothing there because I forgot to turn my tape recorder on. Rookie <laughs> mistake, first time in the business, and I screw it up badly. So I told myself, well, this is not a good first impression. So I went back, mustered the courage, and did it again. Then he wasn't quite as good, but I give him credit for doing the interview again, and I finally got it right. But Valuable lesson number one, don't be afraid. And number two, always make sure your equipment is working and working properly. Well, especially now today, Tony, for a lot of young journalists, you know, who, who use phones. Like I know for me, I use my phone to, to do a longer interview with a, with a subject. And, you know, I came back and I noticed that it's not in voice memos. And I'm like, oh, oh like, like where did it go? And it's one of those early lessons. Like, thankfully, I got the interview. Like, I figured out a way to to extract it but having you know your phone charged having you know your tape recorder ready clicking that button and making sure that it's you know recorded it's it, you know it's not a huge skill but you know in the moment you know you're so caught up like you like you know with, with the fire and what's going on that you have to remember those little things because luckily your subject was willing to you know agree to interview you again sometimes you don't get that opportunity well, that's, that's, so, that's so very well put and so very true. I guess one thing that I've learned from that experience and other experiences, you can know all the bases. You can know how to write. You can know how to broadcast. You can know how to do play-by-play, -play, how to edit video, how to edit audio. You know all that stuff. But what we can't teach you as, as an instructor and as someone new in the business is work ethic, professionalism. Don't forget to do things like you say, charging your phone. Make sure you're there on time at an event. There's nothing that bothers me more than when someone, and myself included, when I do not get to where I'm supposed to be on time. Mm. That bothers me more than you know it. I had an old instructor way back in the day. He used to always tell me at Fanshawe, what time is the 10 o'clock news tell me? And I would say 10 o'clock, and he would say, correct. Not 10.02, not 10.05, not 10.15, 10 o'clock. So always be there on time. And those are the things that you can't really teach. No. You just learn those life lessons as you go. And, and that life lesson, the first day of my, my broadcasting career was one that, you know, I'm very grateful for looking back all these years later. No, that's some great advice. I mean, I know for me with, you know, covering sports and, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, the press box, you know, they always say, you know, it opens about two hours in advance. Like people are like, Oh, you know, that's so early, but, I don't know, for me, I always find, you know, when you get to a sporting event, you like to, you know, get yourself settled, you know, grab a bite here or there, but then, you know, you get to hear, you sort of get that feeling and anticipate what the game is going to be, you know, maybe, you know, there's a story there that because you're the one that showed up two hours in advance, you could report on it and you could be the first one there compared to the guy that, you know, shows up just 10 minutes before puck drops, so it's very important punctuality and, and you're right, Tony, like I think starting early, those skills, it, it will only serve you well down the line in your journalism career. And you know what, quite honestly, especially for the sports reporter, when you get to an event early, those are some of the best memories because you yeah. can meet scouts, you can meet former players, 
you know, and even if you get early, you can do some interviews at some levels of, of, of sports, not so much the pros, but in junior hockey. I love going to the game early, as early as I can, if my other work allows, allows it, and just going to talk to a coach, especially in Mississauga, James Richmond, yep. coaches, the OHL skill heads, and I just love talking hockey with him, whether it's about his team, it's about his experiences, about new methods of coaching, about new techniques in the game. Just the way he observes the game is so much at a higher level than I. I, I love talking. I love learning. love talking to scouts. You know, who are you looking at? Why is this guy? And, and it's really interesting to hear them open up ahead of the game. So, again, punctuality is important. But sometimes some of the best lessons and some of the most fun you have if you're at a sporting event isn't so much just the event. It's everything around there. It's the people that you meet, whether they're former athletes, scouts, fans, whatever. And, and I try to kind of soak that all in. And that's, you know, some advice I would give for sure to yourself and to other people. And, and you know, and it's a silly phrase, but dress to impress. I mean, I know you're at a sporting event, but try to, you know, try to dress appropriately if you can. Um, I think that makes a big impression too. You are always, and I know this might sound odd, but you're always selling yourself. Mm. Um, you never knew who might be there to hear you. You never knew who you might meet. You just never know what door or doors may be open. So if you get to an event early, you're dressed to impress, you just never know what good could come out of something like that. No, for sure. And, you know, that's, that's a philosophy that I always do. And, and, you know, because again, you know, you're always being watched and, you know, it may sound Orwellian in 1984, but it's sort of true, you know, because, not only are, you know, is your social media presence being monitored by various people, but the way you carry yourself at sporting events is, is so key. And you often have to learn that on the fly. But Tony, you know, back to your Owen Sound days, because you talked about how, you know, you cover news while you were at Bayshore Broadcasting. And I know for a lot of young sports journalists and writers, you know, sometimes they have to go to news before they can cover sports. So, I'm, you know, it may not be as exciting covering City Hall or a Board of Education meeting compared to a hockey game or a baseball game, but you certainly learn those important principles and traits of being a good journalist that will then allow you to be successful in covering sports. Absolutely. And I've always maintained, Lucas, that if you look at some of the best columnists in North America, and I'm talking newspaper columnists, the Bruce Arthur's from the Trump. Toronto Star, Steve Simmons, Toronto Sun, Mitch Album for years in Detroit. Um, those, those are sports columnists, but they can easily make the transition to news. And I've always maintained that a sports reporter, he or she can make the transition to news easier than a news reporter making that transition to sports. You just have a broader range of interest. I think you're more knowledgeable about things because you're not only interested in, in a small segment of society, as a sports and a news fan, your interest is much wider and, must, and much more varied. So I really think it helps you learn the basics. Um, again, when I was young, I didn't really want to do news, but looking back, Lucas, I'm very glad I did. It opened a lot of doors for me. It made me hungry too. It made me realize I really want to somehow get involved in sports if I can. But it doesn't mean sports news doesn't require a news type of background or a news type of integrity. A lot of sports news we're hearing nowadays through the, uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of it is about storytelling, about people, what they're going through. That's not about sports. That's just about human interaction and about people. And it's all about storytelling. Whether you're telling a story about sports or news or a council meeting or a board of education meeting or a hockey game, it's about telling a story. And, I, and that's another thing, you know, I try to, I try to impart that kind of wisdom to, uh, to all the students. And it's funny you mentioned Bruce Arthur, of course, is a great sports columnist. He's now actually a coronavirus columnist for the Toronto Star. And it's very interesting to see how these newspapers are shifting because obviously there's no sports on TV for the time being to now, you know, shifting their resources to obviously stories that, are about life and death. And I think that if you have more of those skills, like just being a multi, like being a multimedia journalist who can write, broadcast, do production, et cetera, I think the ability to tell 
different types of stories just makes you a more hireable journalist in this in this t- time frame. You know what? It's it's a great point. I love reading what Bruce has written about the coronavirus. He's really articulated his his articles and his sentiments so very well. Um, one of the phrases that I know that we use at the College of Sports Media is you can never have enough tools in the toolbox. Yeah. So the more you can do, the more you know, the more appealing that will make you to people that hire broadcasters. Like at our school, and, I, and very much like every, I'm sure, broadcasting and journalism school across the country, if not the world, we do more than just write. We do anchoring for TV, anchoring for radio. We'll do radio shows, podcasts. We'll have you report. We'll have you write highlights. We'll have you write stories, um, produce, camera work, direct, PA, all these types of shooting a camera, all these types, video editing, radio editing, I I could go on and on. All these types of offshoots from journalism, I know schools across the country are doing their best to teach, and the students are really embracing that. And again, for advice, if you are young and you want to get in this business, embrace everything. You may have a path where you want to go, but it doesn't mean something interests you more and you kind of swerve off your initial path. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with finding out what you like, what you're good at. I never had a desire really to be a reporter. I wanted to do play-by-play. That was always my goal since I was a day old. Well, I tried play-by-play. I liked it. I wasn't really good at it. You know, and looking back, I kind of realized I'm not going to get much better at it, and the competition is so fierce. But then there were opportunities in reporting, in storytelling, and I kind of navigated myself towards that, and, and I really enjoyed it. So it's not like the one initial path you have, and if it doesn't work out, doesn't make you a failure. It just makes you realize, maybe I should try something else, or you may end up liking something else more. Not, nothing wrong with either of those, uh, those paths, and for me, I was very lucky. Like I say, I love play-by-play, love doing some color on games, still do, still do to this day. Mm-hmm. Love the sideline reporting, loved it all. And I've been very, very lucky. So speaking of your path, Tony, how do you go from Owen Sound (laughs) to Toronto to the score, which I know for a lot of my younger listeners and myself included, like that was the TV station I used to watch as a kid. Like I used to watch you and, and so many other personalities in what was a very like cool, unconventional news sports news network that really was sort of ahead of its time back 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 in the day well i always uh, used the argument the score was the web before the web became prevalent Mm. we were constant news constant information our ticker was unique and new constantly updating the scores or constantly updating news highlights constantly so uh yeah it's it's amazing how many people still talking about the score even today It's, it's remarkable the impact that's had on not only people that want to get in the business but just the general spectators and viewers. So I was in Owen Sound for 10 years, um, and then I moved to Queen's Park just to get away from broadcast. I worked for an MPP at Queen's Park as his assistant, and then I worked a bit about doing media work at Queen's Park, and I liked it, but there, was a, there were some jobs at the score. So I applied at the score, and John Melville, who was in charge of the hiring at that time, recognized my name. And I'm thinking, I don't know John. How does John know me? Well. Again, small world slash big world. When I was in Owen Sound, I did a sports talk show, usually Monday to Friday, sometimes on Saturdays. Well, John Melville had a cottage in Sauble Beach, which is 20 minutes away from Owen Sound, and he would listen to my show every once in a while. So I go back to what I said earlier, Lucas. You just never know who's listening, who's watching, who's reading. You are selling yourself every day. So when I applied for the score, John recognized my name and said, well, come on in for, you know, just come on in, take a tour, see if you're interested. So I was still working at Queens Park, and I went after work. We were done at 5, and, of course, the score is, you know, pretty much 24-7. There's activity because the sports is at night. So I went after work one day, and I kind of saw it, and I realized, boy, pretty cool place, really interesting. You know, it was pretty cool. So I, I did some stuff, and James Lebowski, yep. who, of course, for years was on TSN, a colleague of mine with the score, doing radio in Vancouver now, he was there. So I, 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 James said, here, let's voice some highlights. So I did some highlights. I voiced some highlights. 
we had it recorded, showed it to John and the others there. And because John knew me and because the highlights were okay, I got hired a short while later on a freelance basis mm. because they didn't want to give up my, my Queens Park and they didn't want to hire me full time, which was fair. And then about a year or two later, as a freelancer, they hired me full time. So again, work hard, timing, making an impression, all those types of things. No, for sure. And, and you know, connections are, are so important and, and, and you hit the nail on the head about, you know, you never know who's listening, which is why it's, it's always important to never take days off in this business, whether it's writing an article, doing a live report, make sure it's always the best because you never know, you know, who's going to be watching you. And Tony, it's interesting because I mean, back then, I mean, it was pre-social media days. So I think today, I mean, you know, while it's still hard to find, you know, a job in the industry, there are different ways for, for you to get noticed, whether it's, you know, uploading your content on YouTube, to Twitter, or, or whatever social media platform there is compared to how you got noticed, you know, just being on the radio. Yeah, and that's a great point. There are so many other avenues for you to get your message out, if you will, and for you to show what you can and in maybe some cases cannot do, but more what you can do. YouTube is a big one. YouTube channel is big. I know Kate Bernass yep. often talks to our students. And one of the first things she'll say is wipe out your social media because you may have embarrassing photos, maybe embarrassing videos. Wipe it clean and start anew. I'm not going to go that far. I will say, and I think you hit this on the head, Lucas, use social media, whether it's YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, to show what you have to show your content. A friend of mine, Mike, works for the city of Mississauga. And I think of him as this teenager because I've known him for so long. But now he works for the city of Mississauga doing video content. I see him at the rink. He's kind of in charge of their video board, making sure that everything's working properly for the games. Well, he put an amazing video together about Mississauga and the COVID-19 disease. And I realized if that doesn't sell Mike, I don't know what will. Because I watched that video and I was so impressed by how it was put together, edited, the way it was shot, the way it was written. And Mike had his hand in all of that. Like there is no better selling point, I believe, than social media. And I know there's a lot of bad with social media. I think we've all experienced that. But you can use it for a lot of good as well. And, and you're, you're right, Lucas. Use social media to promote your product, to do interviews like you're doing, to put podcasts together. I know the students that I'm involved with are, have a lot of different podcasts, a lot of video, uh, different video chats. So yes, yes, yes. Sell yourself using social media. But remember, you never know who might be watching or listening. Just be careful because sometimes we say silly stuff. No, of course. That's very true. If you're looking to advance, remember something you said, maybe even as long ago as 10 or 15 years ago could come back to bite you in the butt. Mm -hmm. So just be careful if you're really serious about this business, what you post. The other aspect I will say, it's much like an athlete. There are only so many jobs in pro sports. Mm -hmm. There are only so many jobs in media. Yes, there's more different types of media today, but there's still only so many jobs. So keep that in mind. You might hear the word no a lot. Mm -hmm. I know I did, and I know a lot of people do. It's up to you how hard you want to fight, how hard you want to keep going. And while you were at the score, I mean, you, you know, you did a lot of, you know, different tasks. You know, I mean, I remember you as a sideline reporter for the, for the Toronto sports teams. And, but, you know, it, it's interesting when looking back, because I was watching some old score highlights on YouTube, whether it was, you know, Tim and Sid and score tonight or court surfing. I even found a video of the launch of the XFL where there was this like launch party had that, that, that the score hosted. And, and it just, you know, again, like, I think it appealed to younger people because it was so fresh and ahead of its time. And, and, you know, you could say a little bit unconventional compared to what sports broadcasting was like at, you know, let's say TSN, for example. And I don't know, like Tony, like, like am I, you know, am I off there in that assessment? No. Because, it, because to me, if the score was in 2020, I don't know if you could get away with perhaps some of the yeah. things that, 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 you know, you guys did just because it was okay for the time. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I mean, I, it's funny, as soon as the internet became more and more popular and more and more available, if you will, 
and 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 the growth of the internet continued to go like an arrow straight up. I think the score really suffered as a result because what they did was give you information that you may not be able to get anyplace else. Well, now you can get hockey highlights pretty much anywhere, anyplace else, YouTube, NHL.com, the, the websites, team websites, whatever. And it's the same thing too for information, right? You know, we used to have the breaking ticker. Well, it's still great, don't get me wrong, but a lot of people use the phones or the internet, their computers to get the information now. But there's no doubt what the score did with Cabby on the street. Yeah. That was so different. Ice surfing, you know, with Steve Coolius and Ludzik, Steve Ludzik, showing highlights, going game to game. That was different. Um, when we do the live interviews post-game, especially during the NHL playoffs, nobody was doing that. And I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll, I'll give you a little trick. At one point, uh, we would show the scrum. So we'd have the camera person walk into a media scrum at a post-game playoff game and just roll and then just go to the next press conference like it was live. We would then send that tape down and play it live. So people thought it was live. <laughs> but we just, it, just, it just sent what we call raw, and people thought all that was live, so doing that stuff. Putting graphic and information on the side of, of our screen, again, nobody else was doing that. I talked about Cabby. We had the, the footy show with, with, with um, Christian Jack and James Sherman. That was different. Going back to the sports world, did a half hour show on the world of sports outside of North America. Nobody else was doing that. So I think we were more loose. I think we were having fun. We were younger. We weren't afraid to take chances. I think we were very creative. And we had a really good leadership group. Mm. Anthony Ciccone, who was the program director, really energetic and young and said, let's try it. Like the worst that can happen is people don't like it, right? Yeah. You know, we were weren't very corporate, which was a, a big benefit for us. And Dave Rutherford, who was more of the news uh, director, had great story ideas for reports. And, and we didn't just do hockey reports. I remember doing basketball reports and baseball and soccer and, and Olympic stuff. So really, really fun, really enjoyed it, and really grateful that I was there. It's funny, if I had any regret, I wish I was 15 years younger when I left. <laughs> you know? Like, it's because I learned so much from, from the others. Because I was more of a news person. I was more serious. I was more, you know, straight, straight line, straight arrow. And I, I kind of realized, geez, if I was a bit younger, I might be, you know, more, more loose and more willing to take chances and, and stuff I did. Again, I loved what I did and really had a good time. But, oh, what a, what a great memory. What a great time. Really enjoyed it. And, and I'm glad that you and others, even in 2020, still enjoyed what we did at the score back. Oh, it was, it was very, I mean, it was very enjoyable. And like, because you just like, you know, you didn't know what was, you know, next to come. Like it was so, you know, each day was, was exciting. And you're right. Like this was a pre social media time. So those inventions like the ticker, like score tonight for many people, like, like that's the first time they're hearing this news. Now they can get the news on the phone and it's, you yeah. know, so, so the ticker doesn't, it sort of loses its purpose. But I think what's even more amazing, Tony, is, is just the, the talent that was there that's still in the business, you know, like, yeah. you know, yourself, Elliot Freeman, Tim and Sid, James Sabalski, Greg Sansoni, Martin Geyer, like, like a lot of those names. Uh, Sarah Oleski. Yeah, Sarah Oleski, Donovan Bennett. Like, I mean, you, you know, the list can go on. Of you know the people that were there at that time who 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 went on to continue to have a fantastic career. And that's a credit. Well, I and again, great point. That's a credit to those people. You know the Sabalski, yeah. the Saraleskis, Laura Dykins. You know you name them, Elliot Friedman, all those talented people. But it's also credit to the people who hired them. Mm. You know they saw some talent, they saw something in them, and they gave us a chance. They gave us a chance and they gave us great guidance, which I don't know you really get much of now. And then this isn't a shot at TS and her sports head. This is just in general, not a lot of guidance anywhere nowadays. Uh, and it's because, and I get it, it's very corporate. It's more about the dollar sign than it is about procuring and keeping your talent. You can't do anymore. Okay, who's next, right? You know, but at the score, it was like a big, it really was like a family. Mm. Um, I see some people still to this day that I worked with at the score and I keep them in, in contact contact with many of them I wish I could keep in contact with all of them and every anytime somebody on Twitter will talk about the score invariably all the people I've worked with whether it's Christian Jack or or Sarah Lesky or Deb Medich or whoever we got to get a reunion you know that's, that's <laughs> so 
we've had a reunion a couple times and it's been great to see people and and uh, yeah I'd love to have another reunion for sure but we were very lucky it's mm -hmm. very lucky again hardworking good people great environment a good leadership people at the top the programming the news director they understood you've got talent how to nurture them how to encourage them how to keep things going how to keep things fresh and you know I look at a guy like Cabby I mean nobody was doing what Cabby was doing and I remember <laughs> remember I was do so we would try to save money so we would share cameras I would do a report and then Cabby would take the camera to do his, his thing so I was interviewing Chris Paul in practice one day doing a feature on Chris Paul and this was when he was with New Orleans so this is early in his career so I do the interview straight and narrow he was great I leave Cabby comes up and wants to do his thing with Chris Paul. Chris Paul wanted none of that. Mm. Wanted nothing. He just, whoa, get this guy. Like, it was so <laughs> different. And for some of the athletes, it was, whoa, who is this guy? I know it took a while for Kobe. Yep. You know, Kobe Bryant to kind of warm up to Cabby. So really give a credit to the people that were at the score and the people at the top for making it what it was and what people still think of today. Now, of course, the score then gets bought by Rodgers. And, and you guy and many of you then become Roger Sportsnet and, and Sportsnet, you know, like it is today. So I'm curious for you, Tony, like, did your job change much going from the score to Sportsnet? Were you doing some of the similar assignments? I mean, how did it, how did it change? So, so the score let me go in July of 09. So mm -hmm. they, every year around July, August, they would let go 10 or 11, 12 people. And it was pretty apparent to everybody at the score, they were doing that so they could lower their payroll and get sold and be easier to sell. Mm. So I got, I got let go in, in uh, July of 09. And then a few weeks later, I got hired on a freelance basis at Sportsnet. Mm. So again, the score connections. Glenn McDonald was the news executive director. He knew about me. He worked with me. They were looking for some news people. Um, so I went there on a freelance basis. So I, it was pretty much... Everything I did at the score, except doing features, it was more just stories, and really, really grateful to Sportsnet. Really liked my time at Sportsnet. Got to do, uh, you know, uh, baseball. Got to do some sideline stuff for uh, events, which was great. Mostly news. Loved everything at Sportsnet. But again, new management comes in. They've got, you know, a mandate to try different things. I wasn't hired by the new management. So then they said, sorry, we're not going to use you anymore, Tony, in a freelance basis. We're going to use our people part-time or whatever. And I was disappointed, but what can you do, right? So really enjoyed my time at Sportsnet. A great group of guys to work with. And a lot of those guys I worked with at the school, mm. right? Because because then a few years after, so I was hired in 09 as a freelancer. And I guess it was about 11 or 12 when um, Rogers bought the score. So I think I was still doing freelance at Sportsnet at that time. And when the purchase happened, it was then that they said, we've got to cut some costs. We have to use more part-timers and more of our people. And we don't want to hire you full-time, which, okay, that's fine. It happens to everybody. Um, but I really enjoyed my time there as well. And, you know, you know, again, like, you know, you talk about the journey for, for sports journalists. And I think, you know, you mentioned it, how, you know, journalists sometimes they get no's a lot or, you know, they, they, they don't keep their job, but then they quickly find another job. And I'm just curious your process, because I guess it's, it's, it's again, sort of like this instinctual, you know, emotion that, pe that, you know, people like yourself just say, you know what, this opportunity ends. I know I'm good in this business. Other opportunities and other doors are going to open. Yeah, I think that's a great way to look at it. That's really the way I looked at it. The other part of it for me was I think I was uh, had a pretty good reputation in the business, mm. um, worked hard, didn't really backstab anybody. And I think I was pretty classy, I guess, as a, I can't think of any other word. I just did my job. And I think that helped me. So when Sportsnet stopped using me as a freelancer, I got some work as teaching, both at Centennial for a little bit, and then now at College of Sports Media, which is two to three days a week, so that keeps me busy pretty much 10 months of the year. Um, and then I do freelance work at TSN in the newsroom. So that's usually three, four, five days a week. Of course, the TSN work is on hold because as you said earlier, there's no live sports. So they've really cut back on their staff and I'm a freelancer. And again, I get it. 
I've done some Olympic work as well for freelance gigs. Again, through people that I've met, people that have known me. Again, you make a good impression. You sell yourself, and you know those good things can happen for sure. You've done a lot of video features on 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 athletes and and stories, and, and I think that you know. As much as I like the written feature, I find video features incredibly compelling. And I think, you know, those that can make them really well definitely separate themselves. Like I think of you and Stephen Brunt come to mind, you know, of people that can do, you know, these video features and essays. What goes into making a really good video feature? Uh, a really good video editor. <laughs> well, uh, well, obviously a good idea. And I think you really need compelling subjects, you know, especially if you're doing a feature on a person or an athlete or a former athlete, if you have a compelling subject and if they are able to articulate their situation and their story well, right away you have a great, a great story to start with. And then it's about finding the nice pictures, you know, the music, video, it, it's quite the process, but to me it all starts with having a good subject, a good topic, and then building it from there. I really like doing those video features. And I really am a big fan of ESPN's 30 for 30. I think the work that they do, unbelievable. And, and you know, I was a big fan of The Last Dance that just finished on, on Netflix and ESPN on, on Michael Jordan. Those types of features are, are incredible, incredibly complex. And it's funny because when I did them, I was almost too much not letting other people help me. I wanted to do it all myself. And I should have allowed more people to help me, looking back. I mean, I was very hands-on, which is fine, but sometimes you have to take a step back and let someone else help you. And, and I think that's one of the lessons I learned doing those video features was at times I was a bit too hands-on and I could have used more help in putting them together. The other thing I learned about these video features is how far we've come in 15 years. Mm. The way they're shot with the two or three camera shoots and the graphics that are used and, and the way they're designed and edited. It's really come a long way from when I was doing the, those small ones for the score back 15 years ago. And, you know, speaking of video features, they're, they're usually synonymous with the Olympic games. And that's my segue in, into you covering a couple Olympic games in your career. And, and I've had a few of, you know, my, you know, journalistic colleagues say, you know, an Olympics is one of, you know, the most rewarding assignments, but it's the biggest grind because not only are you preparing for this, you know, this experience, but then once you're there, it's just, you know, constant story after story after story. What was it like? I mean, just covering those two Olympics for you as a journalist, you know, being there on the front lines of sports history. Yeah. So I've been really lucky. Um, I went to the 2010 games in Vancouver, which was an unbelievable thrill. Uh, 2012 in London, for the games there, 2014 in Sochi, uh, 2018 in Korea, though I was stationed in the U.S. I've done some youth Olympic games too. You talk about adrenaline. That's how you survive for two and a half, three weeks, all on adrenaline. Uh, you know, you're working eight, 10, 12 hour days and you're not sleeping for more than four hours. But it doesn't matter because you're all so excited to be there. It is an incredible time. You meet people from all around the world. And you realize how big the world is and how small your world is. And it's just an incredible thing. And again, I got there because of connections I had made through the business. You know, um, I was let go out the score in 09. The Olympics were coming to Vancouver in February of 10. Somebody that I worked with at the score knew someone working at the Olympic Broadcasting. Worked with them. So in 2010 in Vancouver, I did voiced highlights for the world feed. Mm -hmm. So we would take the highlights and voice it for the world feed. So whatever country has the Olympic rights can take our highlights as in and use as is and use them, or take our highlights and paraphrase what we said and then use the highlights. So if you are the chilly TV rights holders for the Winter Olympic Games, you're probably not going to send reporters to Vancouver. So you can just use what we brought in the Olympic News Channel, the Olympic Services, and use what we did for them. And it's, you know, it would save them money. And it was, it was great work for us. I worked with so many people. Um, and there's so many stories. Yeah. So many stories. And 
And you know, Lucas, when you're at an Olympic game, you realize that these are people that don't get there without help, right? Every athlete has a story. Every, every athlete has a family involved or help from neighbors or communities or whatever. So it's really uh, uplifting, very encouraging. And yeah, no sleep, but a lot of adrenaline and a lot of tremendous memories that I've made. Very lucky to have gone to a number of Olympic games. Is there a story that stands out to you in, in the Olympics that you've covered? I mean, I mean, it, like you said, like there's so many to choose from, but is there a story that you did that, that really you know, stood out to you? Yeah, so I, I did an interview with, well, so many. But I did an interview with Gilmer Junio. He was the speed skater uh, in 2014 in Sochi. And he kind of pulled his, I guess, him off the team. He pulled himself off the team so another speed skater could make the squad because that speed skater that he was allowing to take his spot had a better season at that point, but for whatever reason didn't qualify. So by Junio being unselfish, allowing – I'm, uh, I'm afraid I can't remember the, the skater's name that Gilmer went to the side for, but this Canadian skater won a medal, I believe a silver, all because of Gilmer Junior. And just talking to him, I realized what a good dude. And the interview was so heartfelt. Um, it was really, really a really good insight into what makes him tick. So that's certainly one of the stories that I think I'm most proud of for my time at the Olympics. Got a chance to interview Dara Howell after she won gold, you know, first, Snow, ski slope style to win gold at the 2014 Olympics. And what a great story. 19 years of age from Halliburton, you know, relative unknown and her life turned around just like that. And she was so articulate, so grateful. And it was, you know, Sarah Burke who had passed away in that accident a few years earlier. She talked glowingly about the impact Sarah Burke had in her career. So it was a really emotional story and a really uh, wonderful meeting for me to meet so many Canadian heroes like Dara Howell. I want to end this interview with asking you a few questions about your teaching, you know, side of your career, because I always am, am so grateful for, for, for broadcasters and journalists, you know, that are so busy in their lives to then volunteer their time uh, to, to be teaching the future generation. And you've had the chance to teach a lot of, you know, young and up and coming journalists you know, during your different teaching ventures. And I'm just curious, Tony, what's the one trait or skill that they have that separates them from the rest that they can sustain a career in a very difficult industry and in challenging times today? Uh, you know what? It's work ethic. The ones that do well in our business, from most of the students that I've had a chance to teach, the ones who move on and get jobs in this business, I'd say 95% of the time it's because of work ethic. If you work hard, if you are professional, if you are passionate, I would say you're going to find work. If you are more interested in being in the industry than you are in doing the work to be in the industry, you're not going to be here for long. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, that's, what I, that's certainly what I've noticed in my five years of, of uh, teaching is that if you really care and are passionate, it will come through and that will be seen by people who hire people. Um, I, there are a lot of people who love the idea of being in broadcasting, but not everybody loves the idea of the work that goes into being in broadcasting. And 95% of the time, if you love the idea of being in broadcast without the work, you're not going to do well. But if you love the idea of working hard and being in the broadcast business, it will work out well. And I know you teach a lot of students about television interviews, and I'm just curious if there is an aspect that, uh, that young students need to work on in their television interviewing so that they can succeed going forward. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I... I never thought I was a really good interviewer, to be honest with you, but I've learned a lot from watching others and from teaching, interviewing. And to me, the, the big thing is listening. There's nothing more I hate, especially if I'm listening to a radio show where you're interviewing me, I answer the question, and then the next question you're asking me about something that I already answered. Mm 
Mm. Right? I'm not, I'm not just talking about you in, in particular. I'm just talking in general. And nothing that drives me battier than that. And it's because you weren't listening. So a couple of things. Listen, listen, listen. I would encourage people to use humor when it's appropriate, to have empathy when needed. There's nothing worse than going into a locker room after a team is lost. And these young reporters are all giddy and happy and all kind of, oh, we're in a locker room. Wait a second. They're going into this team's professional work environment. They just lost a hockey game. You've been sitting in the press box eating haagen ice cream and sipping on some water and pop. Don't be giddy if they've lost a hockey game. So have empathy. Know your place. Right? Ask questions that are appropriate. And I'm saying questions. You know, and you've done a really good job with that today, by the way, asking great questions. I hate statements when people do the interview statements. But to me, the big thing is listening. If you listen, you can find out so much about people just by listening. Final question for you, Tony. And, you know, we've talked a lot about this interview, about the journey for young journalists, the work ethic. But do you think... You know, as we go forward now, because, you know, we're about to experience a new normal and, you know, who knows how the media is going to change, you know, because of the pandemic. But do you think young journalists now more than ever need to not only be a self-starter, but willing to take a risk, you know, willing to relocate like you did from, you know, from London to Owen Sound or from Toronto out west or out east in order to learn the ropes of the industry and develop those skills so that one day maybe they can get to a big market? Yeah, like, honestly, to me, I would say the answer is yes. Um, If you can, you know, do a bit of everything in a smaller sized market, I think it serves you well. I understand, though, in 2020, it's a bit different, you know, because of technology and because of social media, you can do a lot of things from home and from a bigger city. But if it wasn't for going to Owen Sound and making all the mistakes I did and being the immature clown that I was at times, I don't think I would have had the good luck and the good fortune that I've had in my, in my work career. So yes, I would enc- I encourage anyone, if you have a chance to work in a smaller community where you probably have to take on more than if you worked in a bigger community, I would, if you could, do it wholeheartedly, 100%. Go for it. Learn about yourself. Find out about yourself. Learn about the industry, making your mistakes in a smaller market than a, in a bigger market. Absolutely. 100% yes. Tony Ambrosio, he's a Canadian broadcaster, writer, multimedia journalist, instructor, public address announcer as well for the Mississauga Steelheads. Tony, thank you so much for joining me today on the We Sports Quarantine Chronicles. Yeah, thanks so much, Lucas. Loved it, and I really appreciate it taking the time. Thank you.